and um, and uh, I'm So, graph databases, what is a graph? Um, in the sense of a graph database, a graph is um, the sort of mathematical sense. A lot of times people um, will refer to charts as graphs, and a lot of times I, you know, it's just the term that it's used, but um, what I'm talking about is, is graphs um, in the mathematical sense of um, vertices and edges or nodes and relationships has different names, but it's the same sort of concept of things that are connected together. Um, and this is just a, uh, someone saying, this is a pie chart describing my favorite bars, and this is a bar chart, bar graph, describing my favorite pies. So, just a little joke there. Um, those, those are things you might call charts um, to differentiate it. So Neo4j, um, like I said, Neo4j is a graph database, and we'll get in just a second into what a graph database is and what these nodes and relationships are. Um, but some of the some of the sort of high level reasons why you might use a graph database are um, because it provides a lot of um, expressiveness and um, of your data model um, is an easy way to express your data model in a database compared to sometimes it feels like shoving data into tables um, if you're using SQL or some other table um, structure and um, if you use like for a document database, for example, you know you have documents, but you don't necessarily have good relationships between, between those. Um, so that's that's kind of um, the, uh, the bridge that I think uh, Neo4j provides for um, for modeling data. Um, it has a query language called Cipher, which is very much like um, SQL, and we'll look at Cipher. Um, but it has a lot of power because of graph databases, and also just because of the way Cipher is written, it has some um, some nice features. Um, and then the big thing a lot of people talk about is in a graph database you can do very uh, you can do queries on complex and deep relationships that you would be very hard to do with um, SQL doing joins and whatnot across um, many many entities. Um, and then I always I always like to point out that it's uh, ACID compliant and that uh, provides replication, which are just some nice features. I'll try out this pointer here. See if it works. Oh. Um, so Neo4j has a graph database. 
how does it work, what are the concepts. Um, so like I say, you have nodes and relationships. Um, both of these things are key value stores. Um, you know, like you might have a hash in Ruby or a map in a lot of languages or a dictionary. You know, all these are the same sort of things, you have keys and values um, for those keys. Um, the nodes in a graph database um, have labels, which are ways of um, organizing the nodes. Um, and the way you might think of like a table name, you know, organizes a bunch of rows into a table, um, except that a node can have multiple labels, and so it's a lot more flexible, a lot more powerful. Um, and so, for example, you give a person, a person can also be an author, so you can search for just a subset of people that are authors, or you can search for all people. Um, relationships have just one type, um, and they describe a relationship um, between two nodes. So, for example, a user wrote a post. So the type of the relationship would be wrote post. Um, and you can make it whatever you want. You could say post for, you could say post, you could say p, you know, whatever. Um, but usually I recommend, um, it, it often works out if you sort of make it in a sentence. You have a user node, you have a post node, so you say user wrote post, post. Um, that often works out pretty well, but you have a lot of flexibility. And you can also say um, post written by user. You can go either way whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, relationships are always one directional. So they always go from one node to another node. Um, there's always a start and always an end. Um, but sometimes it, sometimes it does make sense to query bidirectionally, like you don't care about the direction. And so in those cases, when you query, you can just ignore the direction. And there's no performance hit um, on that. You can, you can go from one node to the other um, in either direction, and it's, it's the same performance um, impact. Any questions so far? That don't make sense. I'm going to go ahead, Diego. And then what? Great. Is this the introduction? Um, so here's, the, here's an example, visually, of sort of what that looks like. Um, each of these is a node. Um, you can see here, person and author are the two different labels on this. And over here, they're just regular people. Um, these people happen to have purchased books, and so there's a purchase relationship. Um, these are authors, and they wrote these books. There's nothing really that holds you back from saying, you know, that a person that isn't an author wrote a book. Maybe it wasn't published. You know, it all really depends on how you want to model your data. Um, it's it's all up to you. Um, and there's also nothing that's saying that, you know, person nodes need to have a name and book nodes need to have a title, aside from just your conventions. Um, so, right, and so a person wrote a book, you know, it has a book label, the books have titles, and then, um, so these are the properties, the, key, the keys and values on the nodes, and then um, on the relationships you can, always, you can also have um, keys and, uh, and values. And so sometimes that, that's really, really helpful to be able to say, okay, well, this purchase date of when Alan purchased this book, it doesn't make sense to put it on Alan, it doesn't make sense to put it on here makes sense to put on a relationship. In, in SQL, you'd probably do that as a join table with some extra columns. Um, but here, it's, it's nice for it to be a separate entity, I think. It's, it's very expressive and, and um, okay. sort of more and more powerful as you sort of get into it and see that. Makes sense? Yeah. I mean, why do not we uh, use infinitives in a web? Why? Uh, for example, we use write for dot. Mm -hmm. Why do you use the root not right? Um, so that's that's actually a really good question. Um, so you could do either. Either is fine. Um, I you know I would say either wrote for rights or something. You know again to make it sort of a sentence like author author did write or or, or is writing or you know it's sort of again it depends on your needs in, in uh, the, the, the application that you're trying to develop. Um, so, yeah. But it could be anything. This, this relationship can be anything you want. Um, and that's just, you know, one thing that I think made sense. The person, I didn't actually make this image. Um, I took it from someone else at Neo Technology. And, and when they made that, I think that's just the relationship they chose. So, does that make sense? So Cypher, the exciting part. 
Um, so again, you kind of see Cypher kind of looks like SQL. You have clauses, you have um, um, references to data. Um, but the big, biggest difference that you'll see in Cypher is that instead of a select clause and a from, you have a match. And a match is a way of saying that you're looking for a particular subgraph. And what that means, in this case, this is a very simple sub like That subgraph could even just be a node. You could just say match user. Um, here I'm, I'm giving it the variable user, and I'm matching on the label capital user, capital U user. Um, that's that's uh, pretty conventional, that labels start with an uppercase, um, and that relationships. Actually, relationships, there's no real consensus on how to put them, but oftentimes you see them all uppercase or all lowercase um, with underscores. But so you see here, this here's the relationship type. This is the other label. So you're matching those labels, and then you're defining these variables. And so you define this subgraph. You're saying, okay, I want to look for this. And then when you execute the Cypher query, Neo4j will match that subgraph in any way that it possibly can in the database. Um, and then return you the results. And so here, this is this is you know similar to you what you might like that, like I said, you might see like a join on this, like a user table and a post table, but um, you're getting whole nodes back, whole entities. And so if you, uh, what we do is we say we say where, but then when we say, sorry, we say match, then we say when we say where, we can say, okay, but I only want, you know, out of all these potential subgraphs I potentially have, I only want them where the user ID is 123. You know, that might be, you know, if it's an ID, probably that's going to be a unique ID. Um, but it could be a name, it could be an age, um, it could be an age range, you know, whatever. And so that's going to map, that's going to limit your results. And then you can return, um, and when you return from Cypher, you're returning um, essentially a table. This, this subgraph, you know, might be very complex, but in the end, you're returning a table of data, um, which makes sense because that's, you know, that's how you interface with pretty much any um, data source, um, any, any programming language is, is very often going to be expecting a table or a two dimensional array or something like that. So, in this case, um, we, or we're getting a property off of the relationship, and it's the location. Like, for example, if you had you know, geotagging on your browser when you're writing a blog post or something like that, that could be stored on the relationship, and then you also return the post. So, this is getting all of the posts for the user and all of the locations that. The location that they were in when they wrote the post. So that's pretty simple. That's pretty straightforward. Um, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So here, similar start to our query, we're matching a user, and this time I, I shortened it to the u variable because there's not so much space on this slide. Um, but I'm using the, the variable u, uh, finding users again where id is one two three. Um, finding all the posts that that user has written. And then furthermore, we're finding all of the comments on the posts that the user has written. And then furthermore, we're finding all of the other users that made those comments that were on the posts that the user has written. So this is saying, like, I want to go deep. And what we end up returning is, you know, we start with this one user that we care about. And we're returning all of the names of all of these commenters. <coughs> and we're counting the comments that those commenters made. And so you might say that you know, this person made five comments on this user's posts. This other person made two comments. Um, and if you wanted to, you could even you know, return these as an array of the comments that they made instead of a count. Um, and if you wanted to, I mean, if you wanted to, you could return it just as a flat thing saying, like, you know, user one made this, this comment. User one made this other comment. User one made this comment. Now user two made this comment. But one of the nice things about Neo4j is if you change this count to a collect, then um, you'll end up with user one made this array of comments. Then user two made this array of comments. And so it's much more efficient to return it that way because you're not repeating user, user, user over and over again. Does that make sense? Um, so here, again, this, this would be like a, a join across four tables. Um, maybe potentially across some join tables too, and some of those relationships are represented as join tables. Um, but Cypher will just go and do that. And because I should probably say now that because of the way that the data is stored in Neo4j as a graph database, 
this is a much faster query than you might get otherwise because you don't have to scan an entire table and join it with the scan of an entire other table and another table. What you're doing is Neo4j is smart enough to see, oh, you want to limit user by ID 123. Okay, well, I'm going to start. I can see the user is part of this. So I'm going to start by finding user. You know, that might just be one node. And then the way the data is stored in the database, you're essentially following references from the user through any written by relationships to the post. Um, and so you don't have to look at the all the rest of the users and all the rest of the posts and all that because there's these direct references on disk going from one to the other to the other to the other. And so you can just browse that very, very quickly and then you know, each path and, and um, return you your highly relational data very, very quickly. Yeah. So uh, what is the beginning uh, note? Uh, therefore, see, we start uh, to find the UID uh, one, two, three. You say, what is the meaning of a node, or? Yes, uh, uh, starting node. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, if I wanted to, I could filter, I could, I could put a variable on the post and say, I only, I only care about posts with this property. Um, so, you could, so you could start at any point along this path. Um, it's just that, um, and, and Neo4j, I think, I don't know the details of the cipher parsing and um, planning engine, but I know that it, it, if it can, it will, you know, see any references to nodes in the where clause, and then use that to limit its the start of its search space to browse out. Um, does that make sense? Maybe I didn't answer your question. Okay. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I, um... I don't know how to compare the the engine of SQL to scan entire table with uh, the cipher algorithm. Oh, so if you wanted to look at all of the users, yeah, yeah. So you could remove the where, and then that would give you. Um, in that case, what I would probably do. I type in here. I can't. Great. Um, so if you remove the where, like comment it out, um, then you can then say you. You could say, okay, now give me the user and um, all of the commenters and all the comments that they've written. So that would that would. So you know, the reason I wasn't returning you before is because it was kind of pointless. It's like we already know what user we're talking about, and we just want to see the things that are related to it. But if we're scanning the entire set of users to start with, then we probably want to say like, okay, well, for each user, then show me the results for it, so you get more data back. Um, does that make sense? And then I'll, I'll do some demos uh, of, of Cypher in, um, in a little bit that I think might help some too. Um, any other questions? So, um, some resources. So that's very basic Cypher introduction. Um, and we'll go, we'll look at, like I said, I'll look at some Cypher in a minute. Um, there's a book, a free book, at graphdatabases.com which goes into this, uh, the details of some of the stuff I've been talking about with um, direct references between nodes and properties and um, relationships on disk and how it could be fast um, without having to you know, scan everything. Um, so that's a good book to, to get a, sort of an introduction to Neo4j. Um, and then there's, uh, if you wanted to know more information about Ruby, usually, usually Ruby talk. So there's some good development page, developer pages on Neo4j.com for Ruby and for Cypher. Get more information about that. Um, so, I like, I think as a Rubyist, I like you know, 4J a lot. Um, not so much for the reasons that a lot of people, I think, normally talk about you know, 4J for. There, there, there's a good reasons the, the ability to um, you know, do queries much faster that you might not be able to do very well in other, in other databases. Um, the way I like, the reason I like it a lot is because it's um, very, uh, it makes sense the way that you store things. You store things in with entities and the relationships between those entities, and it, it fits pretty much any data model that you can throw at it um, because it's, it's pretty basic and straightforward. Um, and that's, to me, that's one of the reasons why I like Ruby is because it, um, you know, just sort of works without you having to think about it too much. Um, and it also, you, you sort of are, are able to work at a higher level of, of abstraction so that you uh, you don't have to worry about the details too much and until later, maybe, when you have to like really tweak. But 
um, usually you can just get started and get moving um, and, and do the stuff that you want to do without having to um, be slowed down by details. Um, it also has a really nice web console, which we'll see in a minute, where you can type in Cypher queries, get results back, um, either in a visual format or in a table format. Um, and that's really nice, uh, very much like Ruby has a, um, a REPL console that you can type commands into. Um, so, and the Neo4j gem, uh, which is, uh, I'm one of the maintainers of the gem with this, uh, this other guy named Chris, uh, who lives in New York. Um, and the Neo4j gem consists of, uh, the Neo4j.rb project has um, two sort of big gems. Uh, there's the Neo4j core gem, which is just a basic driver that connects to Neo4j. Um, and you can use that to do Neo4j queries. Um, it's a little more advanced stuff, but that's basically just a driver. And then the Neo4j gem um, is there primarily to integrate with, uh, or to, to, to provide um, these two modules called Active Node and Active Rel, uh, which allow you to model um, nodes and relationships in Ruby. And so um, if you've used Active Record or any sort of object relational model, um, you know, you'd probably be familiar with a lot of things that it does. You know, it does validations, you can define properties. Um, uh, you have associations between things, especially with, with Neo4j, associations are pretty important. Um, and like I said, you model nodes and relationships. Um, there's a, a way to build queries very much like you would build an active, active uh, record, if you're, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it also goes a, a sort of a step beyond, um, which is more of my favorite thing to talk about. Um, there's transactions, like I said, SAS compliant. Um, and there's some migrations. You actually don't need migrations all that much. Um, because it's a schemaless, you know, schemaless, whatever that means, database. Um, but you know, they are there. You can you can define some migrations if you need to for your for your data. Um, we definitely in the general we have uh, lots of tests. We try to make sure that it's well tested and uh, code covered. Um, we try to have documentation. Actually, we have a new documentation site now um, that we've been using. This is this is the sidebar for the Git, the GitHub wiki, um, and our newest version is 6.02. Um, this screenshot's a little old. Um, and we also try to answer issues, answer pull, you know, help help with pull requests and, and all the things that you would expect from an active repository. So we, we like doing all that stuff. Um, you can also you can ask questions on Stack Overflow. Um, we're pretty active there. Um, we also have a Gitter chat room. I don't know if you ever use Gitter, but it's really nice if you have a GitHub account. You can just join the chat room, and um, it's all linked up there. And that's that's a really great way to answer people's questions. Um, and we also have a Twitter account, um, which actually I haven't updated for a little while. Um, lots of stars, lots of forks. We actually, the, 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 this, this project has been around in one form or another since, um, at least since GitHub has been around, since 2007. Um, but if you're looking around for documentation for the Neo4j Ruby project, it actually used to be only JRuby. Um, since Neo4j is written in, in Java, um, originally you could only use Neo4j from inside of Java. It was essentially like kind of like SQLite if you're familiar with that, where it's like a driver that you use inside your application and you save the database files from inside of your process um, as opposed to a database that you connect to. But um, in later versions, I think it was in Neo4j 2.0 maybe, maybe earlier 1.9, you would connect, you can now, uh, you can now connect to uh, through HTTP and JSON um, to get data out of Neo4j um, using Cypher uh, primarily. Um, and so now, so we, we changed, the Ruby gem should have changed to fit that. And there's actually also a new protocol that's going to be coming out um, later this year called Bolt, um, which is a binary protocol and it uses compressed data and all these things that should hopefully make it even faster you know, to connect you know, Neo4j. Um, so that should be pretty exciting. Um, we also won an award from the technology for community contributions. So let's actually talk about it for a minute, and um, then we'll get to sort of demoing Neo4j. So um, it looks again if you if you use active um, <coughs> record. The models look very similar. Actually, it's more like Mongoid because you have to define your properties. Um, since it's since there's no particular schema for properties in the database, you have to say, okay, these are the properties that I want for this model. Um, and this this post model, this post class, will map to the post the post label of the database, and you can query for posts, um, and you can you know deal with their properties. And um, then you can have these associations, which are essentially defined methods in your model that allow you to um, get the, the objects through those associations. So here, if we have a post model and we wanted to get all of the authors of all the posts, that's going to browse through the written by type. 
and it's going to expect that it's going to be a user model. Um, and actually, the rel class um, now is actually changed a little bit. Rel class and type are some kind of nice. They're not exactly mutually exclusive, but you can also define a rel class, which is this, this is the active rel model, um, which defines some behavior if you want on, on relationships. You don't have to have that. You can just go. You can just have associations like this line. Um, but uh, if you need to have like properties on relationships, validations, callbacks, things like that, um, then you start running an active rel. Um, so modeling data, pretty straightforward. Are there any questions? No. Yeah. yeah. I have two questions. Uh -huh. sure. uh, the first one is uh, 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 your previous uh, query. Mm -hmm. uh, go back to it. The, did you do a benchmark before? Uh, with uh, in comparison with uh, MySQL or another SQL like I have not done a benchmark. This this query you're talking about here? Yeah. I have not known. Uh, I I would like to know that uh, uh, it is uh, really faster than uh, MySQL or not. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know for sure. I would guess that it probably. And again, I think it depends on um, the the data and how much there is. Um, if there's just a little bit, then it might not be that much faster. Um, it's certainly simpler. Like with the yeah, yeah. Very short. Um, the other thing is um, about Neo4j as a graph database. Usually, um, the other thing I actually I guess I forgot to mention is that um, you you generally want an index on the ID property for the user label to be able to look up that user very quickly. Otherwise, it, it will have to scan through all the users to figure out which ones it has to, it has to start with. Um, but the thing about Neo4j is that if you have these indexes into your into your um, nodes that you're going to start with, um, then you're essentially just browsing the local area of your data. Um, and so no matter how much your database grows, the query stays the same um, performance. Okay, thank you. So uh, second question is uh, uh, I, I would like to know the learning curve of Neo4j. Uh, what do you think about uh, a, a normal programmer with uh, two or three years of uh, experience? Uh, how <coughs> how long a programmer need to uh, start using uh, Neo4j in practice? That's a good question. Um. Because uh, normally we just use MySQL or SQL Server or something like that. Yeah, totally. There's definitely some things that you have to wrap your head around with um, taking a subgraph and turning it into a table. Um, that can be sort of tricky. The, the, I think one of the, the big things that, that throws people sometimes is um, like if you have if you have a chain of like three nodes with two relationships between them, those you know if they're the same relationships or something, you you could potentially match a whole bunch of different configurations with the same node matching multiple times off you know, different different directions. And so that's something that, that throws people and you sort of have to work through that. As to like how long that takes, um, I guess it depends, like, I, I, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Like it depends partially on, you know, how, how intensely you're using it, or if it's just sort of something you're using as a side project that you're playing with occasionally. Um, you know, if you were, if you're using it for your job, like if you, if you were a programmer and you came into a company that was using Neo4j, you know, I, I imagine within three or four weeks you'd probably like more or less be able to get the hang of Cypher and things like that. So four weeks? Yeah, if you're using it like as your day job, that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? What are you on the hot end? In which application should we use new project? So that's a good question. Um, I, I might answer that by saying what applications you shouldn't use it in, maybe. Um, I, I, so oftentimes, okay, so I'll start, I'll start by saying this. Oftentimes it's really recommended for, um, for situations where you have um, complex or deep relationships, and so that can be like social uh, social networking is one of the, the, the big thing that people mention a lot. Um, if you want to find friends of friends, um, that's a big query that can be a lot faster in Neo4j or in a graph database in general. Um, if you another big 
use case is um, fraud detection is often mentioned. And so that's a, a case where you would, um, you're looking for a, essentially a subgraph. You know, for fraud detection is like you have, you know, three or four or five people who are sharing, like they're sharing a credit card and they're sharing an address, you know, they're, they're, they're operating this little ring and they're, they're avoiding detection because they're not, you know, they're not repeating addresses exactly. They're, they're sort of spread, it's also sort of spread around and they're trying to be smart. But with the graph database, oftentimes you can look for this information very quickly um, because it's just a subgraph of, of like, you know, do I match this pattern of suspicious behavior um, in, this, in this sort of con area of connections? And so, a lot of, you know, that's, that's not something that you could do with SQL or, you know, document databases or whatever. Um, the, the big reason why that's, why that's normally um, good with graph databases is because you can do it real time. Um, and you can, you know, as soon as someone applies for a credit card, you can check out all of the potential relationships and any other people that have that address and someone else that shares their social security number if they're in America, um, things like that. And so you can very much just like quickly look around them and be like, oh yeah, I, I noticed now that there's a suspicious pattern here. Um, so is that. And then the other thing I'll mention is, is a big use case is recommendation engines, um, where you want to be able to say, um, to an example, like um, if you have um, similar to like the, the graph I had before where you have people and you have books maybe that they've purchased, um, then you could say, take a particular person, find all of the books they've purchased, and then find all of the other, the other people that have purchased those books. Okay, and then what you essentially want to do is you want to, you want to go from this person through all of the books they've purchased to all the other people and find out which of the people have the most books in common um, because those people are probably have a similar taste to the person you're, you're, you're talking about. And then what you do is you say, okay, now find all of the books that those people have bought and find the ones that, that haven't been purchased by the original person. So you can give a recommendation on books that they might like because of people with similar taste. Um, and so that's, that's something that would potentially be difficult or expensive to, to do with a um, traditional database. And especially even as you get into like if you if people have rated a book with a with a like one to five rating, um, then that gets even more complicated because you want to have like potentially similarity scores based on algorithms of like I don't, I don't even get into it, but yeah. Um, so so there's that. But you have uh, let me actually I have one more thing to say and two more things to say. Um, so. I would say also though, I, I often enjoy using Neo4j for just any sort of database that I, I want to build, like any any sort of database that has you know entities, the sort of things we expect. You know, you're making an application and you have users and you have documents and you have um, uh, just whatever you might be working with, you might have donuts or whatever, right? Like products and um, vendors and all these things that like, you know, it's it's very nice to be able to represent these nodes and these relationships to, to make, make things together. And you'll sort of see the visualization of that in a minute that it's, it's nice to sort of work with. Um, the, 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 and the situation where I think it, it's not as good, uh, it, it can work sometimes, but if you're um, querying, if you, if you have data that you're storing where you're just like, you know, sending lots of logs of, of data, lots and lots of like repetitive event information, um, you know that's going to generate a lot of data, and you don't, and if, especially if you don't necessarily care about the, you know, exploring the relationships. Sometimes, if you have events, you can actually extract them out into like a network of things that, that actually can be useful. But um, sometimes that's not so. You know, when you're just lots and lots and lots of data that you need to crunch and process on, not quite as good. That was a lot of information. I and mean, if you have any other follow-up questions or, uh, yeah. Can, can can you list some uh, big companies that are using Neo4j? Sure. Um, eBay. eBay. Um, they, there's a company that, well, there's a company that got bought by eBay, but I think it's being used by at least one or two other departments. Um, there's, uh, uh, so I think also there, there's like Walmart, but they have this like, Walmart, Walmart yeah, they, they have this like, also this like new technologies division where they use pretty much everything, but I think, I think Walmart actually, no, I think actually, I, I remember someone talking about Walmart actually does use it for, um, 
some of their inventory tracking, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And I know the Walmart does use it for one, for one but um, so they use it. eHarmony is a dating site. Um, I don't know exactly what they use it for. Um, there's a bunch of other. If you go to neo4j.com, they have a list of like people that, that use it. Oh, and um, actually, one of the one of the things that one of the uses that I really like, uh, I've seen and I, I thought was really cool, was um, uh, do you know Monsanto? Uh, maybe you know, I'm just familiar with Monsanto. So I think they're an American company, um, and they deal with um, they make they they do scientific work on um, seeds. Um, and crops, and um, for farming, for farming, and so they they will they'll genetically engineer certain seeds that they'll sell to farmers, and those those seeds will be more resistant to bugs and um, chemicals, or you know certain things that are that are not good for them. They help them grow without without dying so much, um, and so they use they actually one thing that they did. And there's a video on that they talk about this um, that they now. Um, they have they have this whole database of their like the history of all of their seeds, right? You know the, the seed history is a natural tree, right? You have a seed and then some some children that were sort of generated from that um, from that seed, um, and they have this you know going back you know a number of decades this history of, of seed um, data, and so they have this in a in a SQL traditional database, but then they built a tool to um, synchronize it or continuously. Um, Imported into Neo4j, and then using that, they built a service like a JSON API service around Neo4j that the rest of the company can use to make these queries that would be very difficult to, to make in the database. Um, that if you want to be able to find like the ancestors of a particular seed, or you find all of the children that have a certain property, or something like you know these these things that you know Graph Database is perfectly suited for, for um, representing a tree. Um, that's that's very trivial. So um, yeah, so those are just some pretty big ones. Um, yeah, and if you ever, uh, the, the story of, of Shuttle is good too. If you ever, Shuttle is the company that got bought by eBay. S H U T T L. Um, S H U. It's just like Shuttle, but without the E. Yeah, without the E at the end. Um, but they do, they do uh, same day delivery of products in a local city <coughs> through couriers. And so they, they use Neo4j to be able to do those calculations of courier quoting and all that uh, much more quickly than they could in SQL. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, could you express the infrastructure of uh, Neo4j? Uh, how Neo4j is stored on uh, memory or disk? Yeah. Yeah. And um, Neo4j has uh, any tool for monitoring the data in the graph database? Monitoring graph database. Okay, so, um, so there's I'll start with um, Neo4j is written in Java, um, and it stores it stores its data in a folder called graph.db, um, and it, uh, well, it's usually called graph.db. I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be that. If you're using a if you're using a programming language, if you're using Java or if you're using some Java compatible thing like uh, JRuby or Jython or anything that uses J uh, the JVM closure and all that. Um, that you can store the files directly on disk, um, or you can download the Neo4j server, which will store that. You know, it, it runs Java for you, and you, know, you can connect to it um, as a server, and then it stores those files on disk. So, but I think your question is how that actually the structure works. So there is a file that stores all of the nodes, and there's another file that stores all the relationships. Um, each of those are fixed width stores, so the nodes get a certain number of bytes, I think it's like 19 or something bytes for each node. Um, and the relationships I think get some more because they need to be able to track their start and end node and, and something that be a couple of things. So um, they get the, you know they maybe get like 25 bytes or something like that. And so um, nodes and relationships all have an internal ID um, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, so there might be node 0, node 1, relationship 0, relationship 1. And those IDs are, um, they come from the fact that the, the node or the relationship has a particular place in the file. So since it's like, let's say the node is 15 bytes, I don't know if that's the number, but if it's 15 bytes, then if you want to find node zero, you go to, you go to position zero. 
and if you want to find node 5, you go to 15 times 5. You know, so you can look up in the table exactly where you need to go, um, and so you know where exactly on disk that you need to go. Um, does that make sense? So uh, if a neo 4 store the node uh, on files, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it is uh, I use first problem of the uh, I.O. bridge, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I, I, I know that they've done some optimizations, or at least they've, they've been working on optimizations where they'll get blocks off of the disk because you, you, know, you don't want to just go grab a little bit of data. You want to grab as much as you can um, while you have the hard drive. And so I know they try to grab blocks in a predictive manner where they think that there's going to be a block of, of uh, data that they need. I think they're also they also want to work on making it so that um, moving nodes around as needed um, to to accommodate like okay well these nodes are often needed together so I'm going to move them together on disk so that I can pull them off at once so they do some optimizations like that um, but yeah essentially what they're doing is they're they're going to disk um, and so, and actually also I should say that the um, these files are also can be uh, in part or in whole loaded into memory depending on how big your database is. And so if they're in memory, they're, they're much, much faster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you have these sort of, you know exactly where to go. You don't need to read the whole file. You just can go right into the, that point in the file. And then the inside of those fixed with stores, they have uh, pointers to, I think there's, a, there's another file that stores properties. Um, it says like, okay, here's the first place I need to go to get the properties for this node. And so you go here, and here's the next property, the next property. So it's like a linked list. Um, it's not exactly like this list, but it's like a linked list. Um, and so that's and that's how you could, that, that's sort of the idea, is that you're essentially browsing to the certain positions in these file stores. Um, and if you look at, um, actually if you, um, that book, this book here, Graph Databases, um, the, the free book from O'Reilly, um, breaks that down in sort of exact detail about how that works. So I would definitely recommend that if you're interested. Okay. And uh, how about the uh, tool to monitoring the graph database? For monitoring your graph database, um, that's a good question. So I don't think there's any special tools. Well, I don't know. That's that's not. I'm not as, as familiar with the DevOps infrastructure part of that. Um, I know you can use like any traditional tool that can ping, you know, a service. Um, you can use that, but. Um, Built in. I know it also. You can you can have a cluster of Neo4j servers um, in the Enterprise Edition. So there's community and there's Enterprise. Um, and one of the features of Enterprise is that you can have you know sort of a master slave cluster um, <laughs> for performance reasons. And um, and they I think have some things where they, they monitor each other. But as far as external monitoring, that's um, you know more of a you, know, you get you get some tool that monitors anything like. A, some of the examples. Um, I have a friend who maintains one in the Java world. Uh, uh, Net, NetBSD. I don't know. No. Sorry, I can't think of. I can think of uh, the tools, but there's. You know, I think any any tool that will keep hanging. Okay, um, thanks. But that might not be what you're thinking. Um, there's also there's a Slack channel. There's, there's people that are in some areas are a lot more experienced than me in the infrastructure and the enterprise and all this stuff in the F4J. Um, and the Slack channels, that's a great place to find those people so that you can, if you have any questions, um, <coughs> I can share the links to that on the meetup group. So, all right. So let me go into, so we, we this is the, the Ruby model. Um, and I just want to show you um, how in the Ruby model uh, it allows you to make these sort of complex queries. So here you see the Cypher query that, that I made before. and. In Ruby, what we can do is once we've set up these associations, we can so simply say, you know, start with the user, find the post for that user, find the comments, find the author, and then get me the the name of that user at the end and the count of the number of comments. So this is exactly the same as that Cypher query from before, but um, using Ruby method chaining, because uh, none, none of these actually executes a result; it just returns a proxy object to say, okay, give me the posts. Okay, now give me the comments for those posts. Okay, now give me the authors for those posts. And then when we do a pluck, we're actually executing the query to get the data and returning it. Uh, does it make sense? Yeah. So, but essentially, essentially, it's, the query is not going to look exactly like this. But this is essentially what the query is going to be doing: is it's going to be generating this 
this long string of matches, and it's going to be returning um, returning the data for us. So this is one of the things I'm, I, I love about this gem that we've been working on is that you can do this, this sort of association chaining. You can do even more sort of complex stuff, but this is sort of an introductory example. Um, these are the these are the variables, by the way. Maybe that's obvious, but these are the variables that you're defining so that you can use them later to to do your returning the data. Uh, but that's Ruby. I, I didn't want to go too deeply into Ruby stuff because you know it's honestly. I, I sometimes I give talks in Ruby, Ruby groups, so I go deep more deeper into the, the Ruby stuff. Um, we try to support a lot of the stuff in the Ruby community that, that is needed, like Devise is an authentication gem, and Will Paginate is a pagination gem, and Paperclip is a file storage gem, and um, all the stuff. Um, there's some prod products that are, that are made, but um, let's get to a demo because I think that will be, that might answer some questions, and also sometimes um, what I like to do is to, um, you know, I'll show you some queries, um, you can ask me some questions about how you might like, do some things in Neo4j, and I can show you how you might generate those queries. Đấy thì hỏi cấu trúc ở bên dưới ven ra như nào? Không đấy là chỉ sắc vét thôi chứ không có. Has anybody here heard of Star Wars? Star Wars. Star Wars the movie. Yeah. 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 Snake and share. Um, so this is a database. That there's a there's a website called swapi.co, which is just a little sort of a, a play J, JSON API. Um, you know, if you you can you can make JSON API requests to see, to get data back. Um, and so I just wrote a little script in Ruby that would pull all of the JSON data down and put it in the Neo4j. Um, so that this is the result of that. So 